Yeah. I'm on the um, Jehovah Nut Ripening Kitchen at Hohoba. You know Hohoba? Um, it's, it's used commercially, the oil, which is actually not an oil, it's a liquid wax. Yeah. Uh, it was the thing that replaced sperm yeah. whale oil yeah. Yeah. Uh, and saved all those sperm whales. Um, the Jojoba, distant relative of the cactus, um, it, I mean, there's a lot of interesting things about the Jojoba, but that oil, um, it has like the highest smoke point of any, any kind of oil. That's because it's actually a liquid wax. It's not a, it's not an oil per se. Um, male and female trees, the males don't have nuts. The females have the nuts. Yeah. Um, this is not an advertisement for women's lib or anything, but the, the, whenever I have a group of chefs, the women chefs always get excited about the jojoba because the women have the nuts. Yeah, the females have the nuts. <laughs> so anyway, um, the, one of the really interesting things about the, the leaf there, the, it always holds its leaf up a certain way. And for a long, long time, scientists explained that as, well, uh, it's following the sun. Problem is the leaves don't move. <laughs> well, this guy did a study over at ASU, and what he discovered was that when the leaves are held up like that, they grab a hold of the wind, so that the the male pollen that's flying around in the air gets knocked down onto the female. Okay, it's, so an air, it's, it's an airfoil. It's an airfoil. The, the females hold up their leaves like that and the males don't. Yeah. So when, you, when you're looking out in the desert, it's real easy to tell the male and the female trees apart, even when the nuts aren't on there because of the, the way that the leaves are, are held by the plant. Yeah. So that, that nut, um, super, super oily, if you've ever eaten a kukui nut or a macadamia nut, uh, super, super oily, we like to shave them. Uh, we have a coffee grinder now that's dedicated for this, so we don't, because we don't want to get coffee flavor in there. But, but that, those shavings, you put them on a salad, they're really delicious. Or you can just eat the nuts raw. Uh, but remember, there's wax in there. So you know what that's going to do. It's a laxative, right? Very. <laughs> so you don't want to eat too many. Yeah. But yeah. Anyway, they're quite yummy. They're they're delicious. So you got to be careful. Rosa Woodsy. That's our wild rose. Beautiful. We just had an ice cream maker take a bunch of the petals and make it into ice cream. Very popular. They're really they're, they're aromatic, are they? Uh, not as, well, they are, I mean, they have pretty strong smell, yeah. but there are like the, not like those Bulgarian things that you can buy at the store, you know, the ones in the packages, how, how really strongly yeah, rosy they smell. We have a non-native here, Rosa Ragosa, which is from Japan, um, I think. That's our most aromatic rose. Um, yeah. It's a bit disappointing because our native ones are not aromatic, at all. they're just pretty. So the next one is... Um, a lot of vitamin C in the rose hips. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's really what we use them more for anything is tea. What? Okay, rose hip tea, yeah. Yeah, but like I say, the, the flower, this year, this guy wanted to make them into ice cream, so we'll give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the salsify? Um, salsify is the next one. Mary was brought here by the Spanish. Yeah. But the salsify, we have both introduced and native kinds. Okay. So we got a purple flowered one, a white flowered one, and a yellow flowered one. We have a yellow and a purple, but the yellow yeah. is native for us. Yeah. And we use both the stems and the roots. Mm. Stems are real sweet. What about the flower buds? Do you eat them? Have not. Is that something that we should be doing? It's really good. 
All right. A little bit like asparagus. Um, well, what I'd do is I'd cut the cut the uh, the stem maybe a couple of inches below the the um, the buds, and then you how how to... far along are the buds? Uh, well, I mean you'll have the buds at the end of the um, branches, but also further down. I mean you can see on that one, there's yes. the bud on the left. Okay. Down, that's that's a bud. Okay. And but don't bud. let them open. Pardon? Don't let them open. Well, they're they're more tender the the younger okay. they are. Um, okay. I mean, you you can eat the flowers too, but but they're more tender when they're when they're unopened. Yeah, okay. uh, with a little piece of the stem. It's very nice. All right. Yeah. Uh, Start eating that. Yeah. Sunflower. So sunflowers are originally from here. Yeah. From Arizona. I mean, they were taken to Mexico from Arizona. Uh, from Mexico, they went over to Europe, from Europe to Russia, from Russia back to the United States to Canada. I mean, it's the Russians really hybrid. Or they did a whole bunch of work with them, which turned them into a very different plant. <clears throat> but uh, just recently, um, I don't know how old you are, 1995. Do you remember hearing about the... Uh, the fungus that was attacking sunflowers all over the world? No, I don't remember that. Uh, it started in Australia and it start and then moved into Asia. And so it was threatening all these different sunflowers. And at that point, the United States mm -hmm. government got concerned because they thought it would come across and destroy all of the oil, you know, the sunflower oil farms and stuff. Yeah. So they started looking. Uh, it, it was a guy, what was his name? USDA guy's name, something like Gooley or Goley. Um, and he came to Arizona and he went to Tucson and he found the Native Seed Search. Native Seed Search had in its archives a bunch of black seeded sunflower. And the that black seeded sunflower turned out to be one of only two in the world that were immune to that fungus. Uh, so they started looking around, where can we find this? And Tucson uh, Seed Search, they didn't have a whole lot of seeds. So they got a hold of the guy who originally brought the seeds, Gary Nabhan, N A B H A N. There's somebody you should interview. And tell him I told you to, <laughs> to interview him. He's down in Patagonia in southern Arizona. So uh, he told him, well, I got him up at Havasu at, at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. The Havasupai Indians were growing the black-seeded sunflower. So this Guli guy goes up to uh, Havasu. And uh, there's a lady there who I know. Her name's Minnie Marshall. And he... He's pleading with her, oh, do you have any of these black seeded sunflowers? And she just kind of puts her hand back and she's pointing at the mountain behind her. And she says, do you mean these? <laughs> and the whole mountain was covered with, <laughs> with, these, with these black seeded sunflowers. So if you are old enough, you remember when you would buy a package of sunflower seeds and they, they would look mostly white with a teeny little stripe of gray. Yeah. But nowadays they're white with black streaks. Yeah. Yeah. That's because they all have the black seeded Havasupai sunflower in them now because they were bred in. Turned against that. And that's that's the only thing that saved <laughs> saved the sunflower was Havasupai. I mean, there's your lesson right there about diversity, right? right. You got to hang on uh, it and and really Biological diversity is the same thing as human diversity, really, because if the Havasupai hadn't valued that plant because it has extra oil, that's why they, why they bred it in the first place. It has extra oil, uh, super oily uh, seeds. If they hadn't valued that and created it, there wouldn't be anything now, right? Goodbye sunflowers. So It's amazing. I mean... <clears throat> I've spent a lot of time um, thinking about the Convention on Biodiversity, you know, which talks about 
preserving genetic resources. So, um, but it's it's pretty sickening that most of the research that's being done um, on genetic resources is 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 it's kind of Monsanto type people that want right. to they want to patent um, things because they're seeing resource equals something we can make a lot of cash out of. Whereas in that case, there was a resource there that was that had the capacity to to really solve a problem and um, and bring in a a characteristic that that saved something from being completely wiped out. It's a completely different concept of a resource, isn't it? Something that is inherently useful. Um, she just gave them the seeds. She said, "Here, <laughs> take them. <laughs> right, save the sunflower." Yeah. So, I mean, if you think about it, they saved it originally. Mm. There wouldn't be any sunflowers if not for the the people here who bred them. And sent them to Mexico thousands of years ago, yeah. right? Because the the wild plant compared to the the uh, we have the wild sunflowers here. The the flowers are about the size of dandelions. Right? They're very tiny, and and they. I mean, what you're looking at that picture, that is not a wild sunflower. That's they bred that thing. It, so that's years and years and years of breeding to get them big. Same with the corn. Yeah. Uh, so the first time, <laughs> they, they did it thousands of years ago, and now they did it again. Gift to the world. Thank you, Havasupai. Where, you know, where's the monument? <laughs> where's... Now, Washingtonia Robusta, what's that? Okay. This is one of my favorite. This is a couple of stories, and it's, it's as you can tell, I'm pretty long-winded, so this, this could take a couple hours. No, not that bad. Um, okay. We have a, quote, native, unquote, palm tree here. Yeah. Native people brought it. Uh, so it arrives just a couple thousand years ago. Uh, it's called Washingtonia fellifera. Uh, but the Washingtonia fellifera and the Washington robusta are almost identical. The difference is in how big and tall they are and when do they flower. The Washington Robusta flowers before the Washington Fellifera. The Fellifera is the native one. The Washington Robusta is very, very tall and skinny, and they call them dusters for that reason. They look like dusters. Um, and the Washington Fellifera is very short and fat and squat. And their range actually, actually overlaps in Baja. Uh, so they aren't very distant from each other. Um, it is highly likely that the filifera is an, you know, it's an agricultural product. Uh, but we won't get into there. The question is, why, if they live so close together in their geographical range, and here now in the valley, they live, they'll live right next to each other, within feet of each other they'll live. Why are they different? Why is one tall and skinny, and why is the other one short and fat? And I used this is one of the things I always used to ask my students about um, because the answer is it's kind of surprising and funny, um, but it, there's a universal thing in there too. So okay, the tall skinny one comes from south of here. That's robusta, the Mexican one, 80 feet tall, right? Whereas the filifera that lives here will only be about 30 or 35, maximum 40 feet tall. Um, there used to be an animal called a ground sloth. Have you seen pictures of these things? Yeah. Okay. So the ground sloths down south were much bigger than the ones up here in the desert. And one of the was this palm tree, the heart of the palm. And so year after year of having to deal with these ground sloths, you end up with a palm tree that's very, very tall and very, very skinny because what they're trying to do is they would take those giant claws and wrap them around the trunk and pull those things down. And if the plant was tall enough so that they couldn't eat the, the heart of the palm, that palm would survive. Okay, but up here, 
the ground sloths were less than half that big. Uh, something about the desert environment or anything, something like that. Okay, so the palm tree has a different strategy up here. It became so big and fat around that it wouldn't bend. So it didn't have to grow as tall. <laughs> okay, um, so keeping that in mind, right, we also have here in the desert, we have an animal called a pronghorn antelope. Pronghorn antelope is the second fastest animal in the world. It's so much faster than anything else that lives in Arizona. The question becomes, why does it need to run that fast? There's nothing that can catch it. Why does it go that fast? Okay. There used to be, what's the fastest animal in the world? Land animal. Um, the cheetah? That's correct. Cheetahs originated here. They moved over the Bering Land Bridge to get to Asia and Africa. They became extinct here. But before they did, they basically turned that slow pronghorn into the fast pronghorn. The whole idea that I'm trying to get across here is that the way things are right now, right here, are the result of things that happened before that we cannot see, that there's no other evidence for. All through the desert, you see this over and over again with these, these animals and plants. Something made them that way. Um, so I always trot out the palm tree and the pronghorn antelope and tell that story. The, you see the, the white things on the, in the picture? Yeah, they. Those are the flowers. Mm. Those are super good. <laughs> They're called bakaya. Um, Nyabi wiltosh. And um, you either, okay, when the, when the flower space shoots out, before it opens, if you get those flowers, they're just like those little baby corns, those cocktail corns. Yeah. But if you let them flower, then you can pickle the flowers, or you can eat them on a salad fresh. And if you don't get the flowers, then you let them become, they get pollinated, and you let them become fruit then they taste like a baby Ruth candy bar. They're, they're really, really sweet. It's, it's, Washingtonia is one of the closest relatives of the genus of palm trees known as acai. Okay, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. So it's got a chocolatey flavor, it's got a, a nutty flavor, you know, something else going on in there. Um, so we have right here in our valley both species. We have the Washington and the, or the Robusta and the Filifera because the, the Robusta were brought here for horticulture. The Robusta were, or the Filifera were already here. Uh, we have both kinds and yet people go to the Whole Foods and pay, you know, nine dollars for a little package of acai frozen <laughs> fruit when they could get them right off of these trees. These now have three fruiting seasons here. Used to be one, and then it was two, and now we have three fruiting seasons because of the global warming. What is this? It's a cactus and... Uh... Those are baby saguaros. Okay. Yeah. And you can see different ages right there. The one that looks taller is probably about 35 years old. The one that looks little is probably 15 or 20 years old. That's that's what that picture there gives you an idea of what the desert should look like, mm. with the grasses and the. Can you see over to the left of the cacti? Yeah, you see the brown looking thing. Yeah, do you recognize it? I don't know, is it cabbage family? Is it a brassica? It, it is, it is, it is. It's lepidium. It's maca. It's our native maca. It's dried up right there. We call it peppergrass. And if you get the fresh flowers or the dried seeds and grind them up, you've got pepper. So you've got, we've got both salt and pepper out there in the desert. <laughs> 2,500 different things every season. This is what's happening right now. Every season, uh, it's, it's ridiculous in, in um, April, May, because then I'm talking about 60 plants 
and about 20 mushrooms. Um, and then in the fall, in the end of July, August, September, uh, we're looking at 60 plants and about uh, 50 mushrooms. And then there's all the medicinal stuff. <laughs> Just too much, too much to go after. It is, it is kind of overwhelming, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it used to be community, you know, everybody would go out. When it's just us, it takes, you know, you have, it takes time, so you've got to pick, pick and choose what you're going to get. Well, people are beginning to join in a little bit. You, it, I mean, yeah, are you seeing that? Are you seeing people? The kids are more, yeah, the kids are more interested than, than anybody my age. <laughs> and then on the reservation. But it's been so nice to have you um, and uh, hear about your very interesting life in Arizona. Um, I'm looking forward to my box. I'll send, I'll send it, I'll send it and it'll just say, Miles Irving, England. <laughs> Will it get to you? <laughs> Probably not. Probably not. <laughs>